A second conclusion is that he will also keep his promises to the Jews. After this church age, this period of spiritual Israel is done, he's still going to keep his promises that he made to them in the Old Testament. Those hundreds of pages of promises that, uh, that they will get to, to be front and center in a kingdom of God on earth, that's still going to happen, and he will not break his promise. Contrary to what the majority of Christian theologians believe. If you ask them, well, what about the kingdom promised to Israel in the Old Testament? They're like, it's not going to happen. The amillennial position. There, there will be no millennium. There will be no kingdom for Israel. They had their chance. They're out. Wrong. That would be a flagrant breaking of God's promises. In Numbers 23, we read, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried through? Nerve. And the proposition that God's not going to come back and have a, the, a kingdom based on the Jewish people was born and incubated in pure anti-Semitism. The early church reached a point where they just couldn't believe that God would go back to these people who we hate. And that's where their theology came from. Obviously, not from the book of Romans, chapter 10 and 11, when he says that this is still God is still going to get back and he says all Israel will be saved. Thirdly, God's executing this vast eternal plan throughout history. The whole thing. He's seen what's coming. Uh, he was ready for that. And he's still pursuing. At every twist and turn has only advanced his plan. And we now, now, this ball bouncing down through thousands of years of human history comes down and it's in my hands. Here's where we come into the story. Remember that verse we read earlier where he says of the Messiah, I will make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth? Here's the New Testament version. 2 Corinthians 5. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Here's why Jesus came. God and the human race, alienated, separated, and God sent Christ so he could reconcile. That means to bring back together again. To heal the breach. And to do that, he had to not, not count their trespasses against them. That's the forgiveness that we get in Christ. And he says, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's a pretty exciting proposition, I think. It means that this vast plan of God that we've been reading about studying here in Romans comes down to our day. And like I say, now the ball is in my hands and I get to play. This is the most important thing that is happening in the world today is God's plan. God's plan dwarfs anything else in terms of importance. This is the purpose of the world, is to reconcile people back to God. And I get to take a hand in that. I used to worry so much, you know, I was, I was a non-Christian, I was an atheist, I used to be plagued by the thought of how pointless and purposeless life is. You know, if we're just uh, biological beings, if we're just beings that just reproduce and feed ourselves and age and die and then it happens to them and the ones after that and eventually the whole planet flames out and it's just like nothing matters. There is no point to anything. And it used to really bother me, which it should. We have that inner innate sense that I feel like I should be significant. I, my life should matter in some way. Well, guess what? It does. As a matter of fact, it matters in this way right here. The most important project going on in the universe, we get to be players in that. God's using us one by one to reconcile people to himself. It's awesome. 
I can get more excited about that probably than just about anything else. I mean, why not? This is, this is where it's at. And that's the real message of Romans 10 and 11.